I always remember that we were looking at Andy Warhol, who, of course, people knew very well, but he hadn't got the publicity and the, I would say, uh, general um, not, um, acclaim that he has now since the Netflix series and the BBC series and suddenly the plethora of new um, exhibitions about him. So when we started, we were looking at him from a particular point of view, and that was how prescient or prophetic he was with certain issues, such as, as you would say, uh, um, um, consumerism, technology, is that what I would say? Yeah, I think that's what you would say, because you were saying it before. No, when, uh, we started, when we started looking at Andy Warhol, I don't think, there was, it was, as you say, it was, it was before the Netflix series, yeah. it was before the Whitney yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, he was very well known, but it wasn't as... He was known in art history, he yeah. was known, but many of the kids coming out of art college today didn't even know, you know, they, yeah, yeah. they had, you know, you know, consigned him to art history and yeah. he wasn't of yeah. relevance to it. Yeah. And we started to look at really the dark side of Andy Warhol oh. because Warhol, you know, for many art students like coming up through the 70s and 80s, even when, when the art establishment had dismissed him for, for all of these portraits, uh, Warhol was a, a rebel. He was a rebel all his life. Yeah. And the art students who were coming out of the 70s looked to Warhol for that sort of role model. But we, we sort of felt, um, as we were talking about this, mm. that, uh, you know, during, you know where, where are we at now? Two, it, was, it was 20... 18, 2018 when we started 20, talking yeah, about look, we were looking at that side uh, of yeah, it and, yeah and all of the, the 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 new students coming out they were they were looking at many of the other issues the global issues sustainability yeah. like diversity and uh warhol didn't feature very much in this and we were saying well why not because if you start to look at his themes and you start to look at his subject matter uh you know it's all there and we suddenly realized as we went through this long period of research five years of research Barbara, that uh we started to see, I suppose, the relevance of his icons, uh, you know, the, the imagery that he actually captured from the 60s yeah. and turned into an icon. Yeah, the power of, uh, the, power of the icon. And he made, the icon was not just the portrait, he made the Campbell Soup a portrait. You know, he captured the whole, he, well, he was the zeitgeist of that, those, those three decades, really. If you put them all together, uh, you get a, a very interesting history of, of America. Um, but it, with this show that we are doing is not, as we said, a retrospective. This show is not uh, an overview. This show is particular themes that we think are very relevant today and that are being um, um, concentrated on in this. And each of the rooms that we have um, installed, each of them has a theme. And I think they're very relevant to what's going on. Yes, we have the pop, and there's no doubt about it, the pop is very uh, captivating and very interesting. But we also have the darker themes, as you were saying, the themes of um, capital punishment, the themes of um, racial issues, the themes of um, discrimination. And even with Basquiat, I'm jumping ahead a bit now to the collaboration, but you know, those, the notion with the younger artists who also suffered from certain uh, societal injustices and racism. So we're looking at Warhol in a different way than before many people did look at it. Yeah, as you say, it's not, it's not a chronological narrative that we had, the route through the exhibition. Yeah. Uh, these themed galleries that we've yeah. put together really encapsulated, I suppose, the wide diversity of, of, of his work. And my God, did he work. Did yeah. he work hard? <laughs> I mean, he played hard, but he worked hard. And we were looking at those early interviews when he did speak about death in America, and that was in the early 60s. Yes. So as well as, as, as doing his pop, work he was also very always very interested in these other themes going through American society and that's why I think this this exhibition is very relevant yeah. uh, for the for everybody but for kids that didn't know him and I think it's a good way of introducing him yeah of course because there are so many Warhols as we discovered on, yeah. on our journey you know, there's so many personalities so you have the pop Andy Warhol, and then you have the, 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 the right at the end, you have the fright wig and this sort of uh, model who's coming down the, the, the ramp in New York and Studio 54, yeah. all of these exciting things. dressing up as a woman and, as a, and you know, uh, wanting yeah. to be the model himself. But of course, yeah. that, was all, that was all performance. He, mm -hmm. he was the original performer. He, he was the original performer, and what we've also concentrating here on here sometimes is his, is his use of the camera 
and his films, which uh, are certainly uh, very celebrated for what they are, as somebody said, rather than looking at them. And this and also reality TV. He was way ahead of the yeah. posse on reality TV with his um, uh, clips and his Saturday Night Live pieces. So I think that's really important. And for people forget is that TV was just coming on stream in the 60s in the sense of being mass uh, massively available. So everybody had the little black box in their, ha in their homes. And Warhol saw that and used that. Uh, so this, this, yeah. this idea, I suppose, of uh, performing identity, that's what Warhol really spearheaded. He really got it, you know, yeah. and that, uh, you know, he was constantly reinventing himself. Yeah. So you have the pop Warhol, but then you, you know, going forward, you have all of these other multiple personalities with that he brought and performed in his artwork. Yeah. So that in the end, in, in the end of, uh, certainly of, of our research, yeah. we sort of realize he's a complete enigma. Yeah. I don't know who Andy Warhol is. <laughs> There's yeah. so many. There are so many Andy Warhol. And we mentioned the pop, but we also went back further and we were showing the drawings from yes. the 1950s when he did come to New York yeah. and became one of the most com uh, successful commercial artists of the time with his, with his drawings, his tracings, his blot lines. Uh, right. all that. So he was determined, as we have in one room, he was determined to bring that into the fine art practice and I suppose really destroyed the rule book, didn't he? He tore up the rule book and started it again yeah, with, yeah. with fine art practice. I, I think you could say he learned his lesson very well from Duchamp. Yeah, Duchamp would have been his, you know, he definitely his role model. And so this idea of the anti-art object yeah, is yeah. what Warhol brought to yeah. post-war American art yeah. and that movement. And this, you know, it, you know the, the fact that the silver clouds, you know, and real art, art yeah. anti-art object, yeah, yeah. what is it, a sculpture? Is it a piece yeah. of poetry? Or yeah. is it something that you interact with? Yeah. This is, of course, for, for famously where he, he announced that he's going to give up painting yeah. uh, in 1966. I mean, it must have been a crack up when he showed them in, in the gallery. And, Leo's, and they started to float out the door. I mean, it, it was so anti-commercialism or, you know, the selling of the art object as well. Whereas he himself always wanted to, to be very successful financially, coming from a very poor background. So there's all of these contradictions in him and a, a deeply rebel. A, a, and a real rebel doesn't show, to show it off like, oh, I'm a rebel. He was fundamentally... No, anything but it's that mask that you had of yeah, this sort yeah. of, oh, I'm very shallow and yeah, surface, yeah, just look yeah, at the yeah. Surface. Yeah. And, I mean, that was that belied a lot, a real intelligence that was there. And he certainly looked at, he, he enjoyed the top end of American society, but he also looked at the bottom end. Oh, yeah. So, coming from the immigrant yeah. class that he did come from, and, you know, there was even a case where he worked in the soup kitchens. He did, uh, he did know. work in the soup kitchens he quite looked, a lot. Yeah. And then, in we have some of, and his family were devout uh, Christians, Catholics, uh, Romanian Catholics. So, that also rubbed off on him in the sense of, as you say, working in the soup kitchens, the charities. Yeah. And in this room that we're in now, we have behind you the Birmingham race riots, which he, it's a, it's a brilliant print and it just really captures again what's happening now after Black Lives Matter, That's after right. poor George right. Floyd and other, yeah. other people. So he really, um, and yes, he was in Studio 54 every night and, uh, you know, so he, he did everything. How did he do it all? <laughs> he worked very hard. <laughs> he really did. Work, work, work. Yeah. Famously, he sort of doubled himself, didn't he? <laughs> and he, said, he would send an actor out. <laughs> I often feel like doing that. <laughs> but we have up in uh, we have up in Gallery 15 all of the persona. We have the wonderful uh, portraits from the broad, and we have the, uh, the camouflage as from yeah. Tate, and we have the wonderful drawings from um, uh, as well. So in that room we kind of have an idea of what he is uh, journeying through. You know, he's different from yeah. the 60s when he kind of looks like very thoughtful, but he's playing with it because he disappears in and out of the, right. of the silk screen. Yeah. And then others that are more thoughtful. Yeah. So you catch glimpses of a, 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 a really kind of brilliant mind and also a certain vulnerability, and then yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's covered up again. Yeah. And I think we do capture that going through it because um, it's not this sort of superficial, fey person that onto which you can project everything. Very clever idea, but definitely he was the puppet master. That's right. Uh, well, also the other great, you know, titan of the 20th century, you know, Francis Bacon also played roles like that, who played the role of being an artist in that sense, yeah. completely from the opposite direction, from an existential sort of post 50s European yeah. sensibility. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a masterclass in how to 
project your identity as, and the role as an artist. And he liked, he sought out um, Andy. He, he certainly admired Andy. He admired what he called his new vision. He admired, um, I, he admired Andy Warhol in the sense of Andy was um, a gay man at a time when it still was um, outlawed as well as Bacon. Uh, you know, just went round. I mean, um, uh, Bacon had his, his lovers and boyfriends and he had his long-term relationship with Jed, is the one that springs to mind, you know. But yet they were kind of um, ambivalent. You know, they, they certainly mixed everywhere. But also he admired his use of film as well. And I think Bacon saw with, with fine art process that if you keep going back to traditional media um, and ways of doing things that you never uh, keep it alive, you never break through again. And he certainly saw more than any of the other, um, if you like, revolutionary artists of the time, he saw it in Warhol. Yeah, well, certainly we have some of those early films in the exhibition here. We have uh, Sleep and we have uh, Empire, the famous yeah. Empire, Eight Hours of Staring at the... You're going to see that, the... <laughs> you're going to watch that. I, I you, know the story, to... you know the story where Yanis Nekas yeah. uh, brought him to a screen, you know, but, and dared him you know, to sit down and watch all of his own film, and they had to, they had to actually tie him to the chair. He escaped. <laughs> he escaped after <laughs> one hour. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so, but he, but, and that's really good to go back to that because he was deeply involved in the experimental um, film, avant-garde filmmaking yeah. in, in yeah. New York. Yeah. So he was really on, uh, yeah. you know, into all of the so he, he new avant-garde works. He brought what he learned really in fine art world, in the visual arts world, yeah. he brought that into filmmaking. So yeah. that whole idea of the act of looking, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. that sort of the test in the audience, you know, the endurance of the audience yeah. with so, the one image yeah. and, and, you, and how long are you going to stay there and watch it. And, and all the tropes, the filmatic tropes that are normally associated with Hollywood, he turned, he upturned them. And of course, that's why he creates his famous Silver Factory. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all of the superstars, the anti-superstars yeah. that he invites to it, and of course, becomes the coolest place in New York to be in the 60s. Absolutely, and they're, and they're all sort of mixing and gelling. And he's, it's, it's, it's grist to his mill, because he's bringing the whole of uh, the sort of experimental avant-garde, cool, hip, of course, we have a number place. of those stars in the screen test yeah. there so in, in Gallery A. So tell us about the screen test, because we've just uh, finished. We have a selection of there. green, uh, sorry, screen tests, uh, 13 most beautiful women, women in the world, which, of which there are only six in yeah. this particular selection, the Vaughan yeah. selection, which he sent uh, on to Europe, uh, uh, I forget, 1968 or something like that. Yeah. So he was constantly dipping. He had over um, 358 um, uh, screen tests in total. So he would dip in and make a selection for different shows. And so, and one of the selections was 13 Most Beautiful Men, the other one was 13 Most Beautiful Women. Yeah. This selection is called the Vaughan selection, which was sent to Europe, and it has um, six of the most beautiful yeah. men selected. Yeah. On it. Uh, and then we have, of course, the Edie Sedok, uh, yeah, who was a uh, famous uh, uh, personality of the day. God, yeah, what do we call for, her? Bleached, for, for, <laughs> he, 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 bleached twin. For a period of time, yes. He, they, they both went around together as twin yeah, doubles yeah. and stuff like that. But she was the famous poor little rich girl, of course. Uh, you know. But you were talking, uh, we were saying making you look. And certainly the screen tests with the, the stars, such as just uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, uh, Bob Dylan, Dali, standing or sitting for four minutes against a blank wall and not to blink. Or, uh, uh, and it's, it's this idea of making people yeah. look at something. They can see everything, but actually to, to look at what, And I think also that comes through in his repetition yeah. of imagery. It's not imitation, as we know, yeah. and it's repetition to make that. It's no longer an illustration. It's the image and the depth of the image. Yeah. But going back to what I was saying about bringing some of the techniques of visual arts into the filmmaking, yeah. this whole idea of, you know, in, there's, a, there's a movie that we have there, Outer and Inner Space, yeah. with Edie in it, and where he splits the screen. And this idea of doubling in, and so you have reality, and then you have the mirror image of reality yeah. doubling in on itself. He repeated that in his famous uh, movie, Chelsea, Chelsea Girls. Girls. Uh, and many of the Hollywood uh, innovators, you know, in the 70s started to look at Warhol and see, what his techniques yeah. were, and they went on to incorporate them into their own movie making. And for a lot of younger people today, of course, they forget that the movie camera, the Bolex, um, 16 millimeter Bolex camera, which he got in the early 60s, I mean, this was a revolution. You could actually do a movie and, and moving images, and you didn't have to have a sort of a whole um, uh, studio behind you, and you could yeah. process it. And that, that was so exciting. And Outer and Inner Space is one of the classic, brilliant films of yeah. that yeah. time. 
Of course, that all sort of came to an end tragically, you know, in, in that, that experimental period in regard from the shooting, the famous shoot in 1968, Valerie Solanas shoots Warhol, almost uh, kills him. Yeah, uh, almost kills a few others as well. At the factory. Uh, and, you know, people say that when he came back, that it, that it, wasn't, it wasn't the same Warhol, you know. But I would argue with that. I think you know, he certainly came back a more mature artist and yeah. more concentration on that. If you start to look at the imagery even behind you there, Barbara, yeah. just the, 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 those guns there yeah. from, from the guns. 80s, yeah. you know, he started to really widen the scope of what his, his overture, his artwork could be. Could be. So he's, he's really pushing the limits at that point. He's less invested in the, uh, the traditional role of art, art of making an art object, putting it on the wall, and becoming more involved in the performance. We talked about this, mm. the brand of Andy Warhol yeah. starts to, to come out into the yeah. in the 1970s. So he begins to become a, um, a magazine uh, producer. Interview it, magazine, fame, and he loved that magazine. Yeah. yeah. No, he did. That yeah, was that was one of his famous uh, artworks, yeah, you could he, say. He became, and yeah, he became a magazine uh, publisher. Yeah. He did more. Uh, he, as you say, his TV, and then he widened the scope. It took him a bit of time. I think the very early seventies were naturally. I mean, he's scarred across his um, uh, whole abdomen here and afterwards. So it took him a bit of time. But I think he did. I think he did accelerate again. And I think I agree with you. That it wasn't. It yeah. was maybe a different, but it was the same Andy, but different, um, yeah. uh, different expressions. Absolutely. You're going back to early New York. Yeah. Uh, there was a zeitgeist in painting, return to painting, yeah. I suppose, in the 1980s, and you had all of these graffiti artists, Key Herring and uh, Jean Michel Basquet, and you had yeah. um, a few others, Kenny Scarf, and stuff like that. So yeah. there was a whole uh, group of artists who were working with the subculture of New York and they were basically graffiti artists out there spraying on the, the, the metros and the undergrounds uh, and then they became interested, the market became interested in them, Bruno Bishop Hofberger yeah. took in Jean-Michel Basquiat and he famously introduces Jean-Michel Basquiat at the, the factory on the 4th of October 1982 True. where they they say hello to each other, and of course Warhol always with a Polaroid camera around his neck takes yeah. takes a photograph of Jean Michel. Jean Michel grabs the photograph, goes back to his studio, comes story, back yeah. two hours later, dripping wet with a big canvas yes, of the portrait yeah. of the two of them, yeah. thereby equating the fact that uh, you know I am. Yeah, t yeah, I'm a painter too, right. yeah, I, and I'm up to you. And that suddenly just captured uh, Warhol's imagination. He was really he impressed was, by the speed of it. That's how quickly he did it. <laughs> and he was going, he was really impressed by that. And that also gave him new energy, new life, you yeah, know, younger generation. You know. Uh, and what they were thinking, younger uh, rebel generation. Jean Michel would definitely reintroduce Warhol back into using the paintbrush again yeah. for the first yeah. time, you know, because there was that, that, that return to painting was happening and Warhol being a master draftsman yeah. was able to return to the brush because yeah. before he had, he had uh, yeah. stuck with the silkscreen process that we were talking about. But um, this collaboration then, we had over 450 uh, works by Jean Michel and um, by Andy and Warhol. We're, we're lucky we, here we have also the work with Clemente um, um, uh, Francesco Clemente, Basquiat, and 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 Warhol together, and um, they you know passed it around from studio to studio and uh, drew on it, silk screened it. Um, Andy did. Andy was the master silk screen, and then we were looking at uh, what well, and obviously silk screened it again. Yeah. And so those collaborations are fascinating um, to see. Yeah. up close. When, yeah, when yeah. I mean, right. it's based on the, the sort of surrealist technique yeah, exquisite of exquisite corp, corp and yeah. that yeah. sense of tearing up poetry and words and reassembling. Exactly. So the yeah. sense of one, one artist's style being imposed upon the other. But it wasn't, I said, uh, the unique thing about this the particular, the two artists oh. of Warhol and Vasco was that they, they, there was a sense that neither artist was obliterating the other. In That's fact, what I was just about it was to just say. kind of enhancing. Yeah, it wasn't um, sort of a dominance. No. It was, and even with the one with Clemente, it's very interesting. Each of them gets quite a lot of space once you start to look at it. So it was very much a collaboration. And of course, uh, Jean-Michel would have been looking to the older famous artist, yeah. you know, uh, and, and seeing what he was doing. 
and Warhol with Jean-Michel was just drawing on his street um, knowledge yeah, and no, his but was, younger energy. There was energy. definitely a genuine oh, yeah. meeting of creative talents. Oh yes, absolutely, that. but that's yeah. what was the fortunate thing that they yeah. really did respect each other. And just from other. what you were saying earlier, that goes right back to the collaborations with his mother. Yeah. In regards yeah. to, the, you know, those famous illustration books, the cookbooks. Uh, and, hilarious, uh, the know, cookbook, yeah. Many in his, in his commercial days, he yeah. used his mother's We uh, have a drawing there. We have yeah. one of his mother's handwriting because, of course, she had to learn uh, a different language when, when, when she came over. And then he did his collaborations with uh, Peter Beard, of course, the um, uh, American artist and photographer. And they were ar earlier, they were in the 70s, early 70s, um, and all of, we have fortunate to have those in the, in the exhibition as well. So it was uh, harking back to the notion of um, um, uh, collage, uh, ad advertising, his, his work in the, with the advertisements glued on and uh, sort of um, thought provoking sentences written over them, you know, decoration. I mean, they're kind of um, out there, but they're also very, very interesting uh, over a, a two year period when they went to the Algonquin Hotel to have dinner with his um, Peter Beard's uh, cousin, Jerome Hill, who was also a big supporter of experimental film and a producer of, um, of experimental film. So nothing happens just at one period, there's always threads going through it. And when Francis Bacon went to visit him in his, it w went with him to the factory in 1975, mm -hmm. um, he started to say he was talking about painting again. He was thinking of painting, you know, so Warhol had it in his head. It may not have actually uh, come out or manifest itself until about five years later, but certainly that notion was going around in his head. So there's always, um, threads going through it no matter what is happening i think yeah of course he he died so young yeah he did you know 57 was he yeah. one you wouldn't like to think you know at least yeah. what, what would the next 20 years have brought what what would the internet have done to andy warhol <laughs> i mean he practically yeah. in, invented yeah. the internet yeah. in regards to this whole idea of social media, yeah. you know, selfies, projecting yeah. yourself, influencer, yeah. you know, the Kardashians yeah. living the lifestyle of it. Warhol definitely would have relished the idea of yeah. being in that world, being in, in, in today, you know, yes. and, and the access to that new technology. I think he was fearless in the sense that he embraced all these new technologies. He wasn't afraid of it in any way, um, what was the word, uh, threatening the concept of fine art or the concept of great visual art. In fact, he embraced it all, but he could do that because he managed to bring it into a practice that we still find very, very relevant and pertinent today. Yeah, so I, it would be great to have seen what he might have done. So Andy Warhol three times out. Well, three times out for us is, is uh, circularity of time. It's also history repeating itself. We've also mentioned already certain issues such as um, um, Black Lives Matter and we have the Birmingham race riots. We also have our room We have our, now, our geo, geopolitical sort of... Yeah. The narratives that are going on, when you think yeah. about, uh, you know, as, as we were researching this over the last five years, the images that kept coming back to us were, number one, Mao. So you think about China, you think about, you know, the rise of the Chinese economy and how that has affected the American empire and such. Oh, well, you think about Nixon, we have Nixon vote McGovern. Yeah, He's and right we think of it. things now that... Nixon uh, and Trump uh, and, the, you know... Meddling with democracy or, you know, uh, uh, covert meddling. And, and, and then we think of the missiles in Russia in and Ukraine. now we have another um, invasion by Russia into Ukraine. Yeah. So there, that sense of history and those, those uh, huge events repeating themselves, we can now, looking back 40 years later at these images that were created, you know, oh. 70s and 80s, oh. They're just as relevant now today. You know. So that's what this exhibition yeah. is somewhat about. It's that, that notion, these, these images, these subject, yeah. this subject matter, it's just yeah. as relevant today. It's also, uh, throughout uh, the exhibition, there's also a sense of uh, celebrity and tragedy or, you know, fairy tale glamour with the Jackies here. It goes into uh, tragedy and disaster. So you have uh, death and disaster, death in America. And you can look at it, you have, you're born, you live, you die three things happen to you, you know, and you can't escape them. So we're looking at this exhibition is about uh, certain the aspects of, of Andy Warhol. And as we've already been talking about, those areas that people mightn't have known so well, 
and the, the relevance of his, um, his films, his TV, his screen tests, and his subject matter. You could say the Warhols for everybody. Yeah, we you know, we, because that. that sense of you know, there's, there's always the highbrow sense of things, yeah. and we talk about debt, and we talk oh, about yeah, yeah. birth, but also just you know the Brillo boxes, yeah. you know the Campbell soup cans, that they're products that are just you know, on our supermarket shelves. Mm. And Andy was opening everybody's eyes up to the fact that good design is out there, art is out there. You can make art out of the everyday. And that's what really, I think, uh, you know, he would love that side as well. Oh, it's yeah. one of his multiple sides yeah. that we were talking about. Is, but yeah. that says there, there is something in this exhibition for absolutely everybody, you know, from if you're three years old to 99 years old, yeah. Yeah, there is something uh, here for you to take home. Uh, and I think, yeah, Andy is for everybody. He, Andy is, uh, yeah, a phenomenon, continues yeah. to be a phenomenon yeah. and an enigma, as we say. Yeah.